Hey everybody, James with Love My Pots, My Brew Supply. All right, number eight of a 12 part series. We'll really be spending some time on this. So today it's mum issues, problems that we have with mums, how we get on top of these, how we know that there's a problem that's arising, when do we know that the mum's okay. Um, okay, well, let's talk about the very first thing, which is you've come home or you've just had babies and you're introducing babies to mum and you, she's rejecting them. So that's the, the, the very first problem that we're gonna address is basically rejecting puppies. And this is a more common thing with young dogs and C-sections as opposed to natural whelps. Natural whelps, mum's been part of the whole process. She's seen the dogs coming out of her. I think, you know, she's not drugged up. Um, it's fairly unusual to see rejection issues in those situations. Um, but in C-sections, when we come home with our babies and mum, um, mum is pretty groggy. You now we actually travel typically an hour and a half away to get a C-section done. And by the time she's been cleared okay at the vet, she's come around, she's in the car, we've driven home, it's a couple of hours. Um, and that's the point that we will put mum into the crate that she's already been in the past few previous days. We talked about this before. So she's accustomed to the environment she's gonna go in. And then the puppies are in the incubator and sometimes she'll hear them squeaking and her ears will prick up, and that's a good sign. But here we go, we're giving them the first puppy. So sometimes mums just turn their nose up. They're just, no, not interested in this at all. Don't know what's going on. And it can be a bit scary because you know, you're worried that maybe she might do something like bite a puppy. And that does happen to people. I've never had it happen to me, but, it, but I've, I've had reports of people having exactly that problem. So. What do you do if mum's rejecting her puppies? Well, I think the first thing to do is be down there with her, be reassuring, soft voice, giving her a pat, telling her she's a good dog. And then what we do is we take a puppy and we smear some peanut butter on its rear end because dogs like peanut butter and it's got the same kind of consistency of poop and see whether or not she'll start licking on that puppy to lick the peanut butter off. And that seems to work really well. It may take two or three goes of this, but you know, we, the goal is is basically to get mum nursing the puppies without her standing up and getting out of the way or maybe, you know, doing something even worse. So if your mum is rejecting, I would try the peanut butter trick. If that doesn't work, get her out on the floor, want a blanket, lay down with her, make her lay down, stroke her head, um, and then introduce puppies like with the peanut butter trick and put puppies on her and let them nurse. And if she tries to get up, put a hand down on her neck and keep her down. And, you know, say no and with a firm voice. And then reassuringly pet her and, you know, tell her she's doing a good job. And then, you know, what I found is, is that dogs fairly quickly normally come around to realizing that these are their puppies. So what are you going to do if you just don't get past that point? Well, you're going to have to hand raise puppies. I mean, there's two things that can happen that means you're going to have to hand raise puppies. One would be that she's aggressive towards her puppies. Maybe she might even bite a puppy. I've had reports of that happening. If your dog has bitten a puppy, then maybe it's because it's under anesthesia, still and dopey, but maybe it's just gonna be aggressive towards these puppies and you're not gonna get past that. So what do you do? Put a muzzle on her. Put a muzzle on her. You can, if you've got a French with a short face, you can go get a regular muzzle. You can take some plastic wire ties and make the front of it short. So you wanna be able to get it where she can get a tongue out through it so she can lick on puppies and sniff on puppies, but not where she can bite a puppy. So one thing would be to put a muzzle on her. The second thing, of course, is you just simply take the puppies away. If you've got another mum who can look after those puppies, great. Otherwise, you're gonna to have to raise them by hand. And that's when, by the way, you know, things like incubators and uh, <clears throat> feeding tubes and bottles are paramount towards being successful. All right. Okay, so that's, that's, an, that's that one. Next one is, and by the way, rejecting the puppies thing also, get this set up in a nice quiet place where you don't have a lot of foot traffic. Now you don't want mum with her newborn babies for the first time and all the kids in the neighborhood are coming by to see the wonderful new litter. That's not a good recipe for mum being uh, you know, quiet and, and uh, 
uh, you want to put her in a, in a stress-free environment. And when you've got lots of people coming in to see what's going on, that's not the thing to do at all. I think that if you've got a dog that is having some problems accepting babies, the primary caregiver, whoever that is in the house, is the person who should be there with her, helping her through this process. All right, next one would be no milk. And this one is fairly common, um, especially again with C-sections. So what are the things that bring milk on? Well, let's talk about how you know if you've got no milk. You can, typically the front boobs are not as productive as the lower ones. You can take a, a, a teat, <clears throat> and if we pretend that's the teat of the dog, and if you pull down on it hard, squeeze it together and pull down, you should see a drop of milk at the end. Even a little drop of milk means that probably you've got milk coming the way. If you've got absolutely zero coming out, then you're, you've got to have to supplement. And obviously you're going to have to supplement by either, you know, again, goat's milk, espalac, not cow's milk. They have a hard time digesting that, give puppies diarrhea. Goat's milk, espalac is a powdered version of it. You can buy powdered Mansberg goat's milk, which is what we use. Uh, you know, a bottle um, and, and or a feeding tube is the way to go at this. And so you can supplement what the puppies need while mum's milk comes in. If you are at the vet having a C-section, they should have given a shot of oxytocin. So oxytocin is a hormone, it's an injectable, uh, and it produces uh, contractions and milk letdown. And this is almost, I mean, best I know, every vet I've ever been to, it's always given a shot of oxytocin after they've got her closed up. Um, helps clean her out, helps milk production. Nursing puppies, even on a dry teat, will help milk production. So just because you don't have any milk, just don't take all the puppies away and just leave her off to the side. The idea is, is to get her back with the milk production. It might take 24, 48 hours. If you don't have milk in 48 hours, I think you've got a problem coming up and you're gonna have the hand raise. But oxytocin, yes. If you're doing natural births at well at home, you should have a bottle of oxytocin. You should be getting that after you've had the last puppy. Or if you stalled out, I think we talked about this before on the well. If you stalled out during the pregnancy, you can give oxytocin. Be careful, you don't give much of this stuff. And I'm not gonna give you the dosage, but it's not very much, and you just stick it in their, in their rump and give them injection. If you start giving oxytocin, by the way, during a birth, because you've got a stuck puppy, you really could start having some problems here. You could actually have too high an intrauterine pressure and actually uh, uh, burst their, you know, their uterus. So got to use, use this stuff cautiously. Um, I never have to give it because the vet always gives it um, when we have the C-section done. Okay, so what are, there are other things that you can give, and I, uh, Fenugrin uh, is, I think it's fenugrin, uh, is a natural product that uh, for, maybe it's, well, people will collect, correct me on this. Uh, I have to go look it up. But anyway, there's that fenugrin seed that can help with milk production. I think you probably need to be doing that, well, probably right away if you have problems. Um, but just to, just to reiterate, um, can take time for milk to come in. Nursing puppies will help milk production. Oxytocin helps milk production. Um, okay, so the next one is too much milk. And this can lead to um, um, mastitis. So mastitis, so this is one of the things you've got to watch out for. The sign of too much milk is, number one, she's really bagged up before you even has puppies. And in that situation, you need to be checking her boobs, and if they feel ropey and lumpy, then it's time to get a hot cloth on those particular boobs that are ropey, ropey and lumpy, and then express them by hand. You can express them by hand and get the milk out. Um, because you know, otherwise, you can get in a situation where she gets really painful red boobs and she will start running a temperature. A temperature of 101.5 or higher uh, in a dog that has ropey red uh, um, hurting boobs is a sign that you've got um, uh, eclampsia on the way. No, not eclampsia, mastitis, sorry, mastitis. So the other thing that you can see is puppies are nursing, they've got milk running out of their noses, and that can be a bit worrisome because you worry about puppies getting milk inhalation. My experience with this is there's not a darn thing you can do about this. 
One thing that maybe you can do is if you're in this camp where you take your puppies away and you let them nurse every two or three hours, you pile all the puppies on at the same time, that the puppies have a freeze with all to try to get to a nipple because they're thirsty, as opposed to drinking when they're ready, they're being held back and being fed every few hours and they get really greedy and because of that they might get milk running out the nose. If that's the case, you might do one or two things. Split up the feedings where you don't have all the puppies piling on at one time. Or better yet, leave puppies and babies together and use our whelping system that you don't have to be the surrogate mother and decide where they're gonna feed. Um, if you get a puppy, that puppies that do have too much milk, I mean, you can take a napkin and soak it up, but there's not really much else you can do. Do listen to their lungs. And look, when they have got milk running out of their noses, you may hear crackling noises from their chest. But the more important thing is, do they have crackling noises from their chest half an hour or an hour later? Because if they do, then they have got milk in their lungs. And that could result in pneumonia. And that is a life-threatening situation for a dog. And the right treatment for pneumonia is to get clavimox or amoxicillin, get an antibiotic on board to stop the secondary infection that's caused by milk in the lungs. Um, okay, number four, infection. So the dog has just been through, if it's a C-section, the dog has just been through surgery, it's been cut open. They could have got pathogens in there when that happened. So the, the thing on this is to, if you're in doubt about the well-being of your dog, it's acting listless, not happy dog, take his temperature. Temperature should be less than 101.5. Anything above that is a very immediate concern, especially after a C-section. And that does require that you do go and list your vet. So the kind of things that can happen would be, you know, an infection caused by the incision itself, the right treatment for that is antibiotics, and the right treatment is to get antibiotics on board now and to follow the complete course of whatever you've given for the full amount, typically going to be eight days. Um, another thing that can happen is you can have stitches that start opening up, and that again will allow a bacteria to get in, and depending on what kind of stitches they have, the whole thing might open up, and then you're in a really bad situation. So, especially within that first 24 hours, 48 hours, check stitches to make sure that they're clean, that they don't look horribly red. They will look somewhat red, but they look horribly red and there aren't any stitches that are open. Now, if you get a little stitch that's got a small opening on it, you know, the size that you could get maybe, you know, less than a pencil eraser in, then that's not necessarily of undue concern. In a situation like that, I would probably go get some Neosporin and spread some Neosporin on it to just try to stop anything getting in. But a small opening, not really a problem. But if you can see the whole stitches are coming apart, Time to go to the vet on that one. Um, again, any any time you've got a dog that you think is in trouble, take his temperature. Anything above, you know, one hundred one point five or higher is absolute immediate cause for concern. Normal temperature on a dog is something around 100, 100.5. Um, all right, mastitis. So number five is mastitis. Mastitis, I think that's right. So mastitis is because you've got milk that's not being evacuated out of the boobs and it basically clabbers up and it can then turn into an infection. And you can get an abscess. You can get to the point where you can't drain anything out or just pus comes out. Um, this can be, eventually can be a life-threatening situation. So pay attention to this. The secret to mastitis is to catch it early if you've got, and what typically happens is, is often the front boobs are not used as much because they're not as productive and dogs do prefer, uh, and they get to know which nipples they like. And so you tend to find that there are not very many dogs on the top, on the top ones. If that's the case, get the fat dogs and put them on the top nipples and try and make them nurse the top ones so they get drained. Because if they don't, you can get this ropey, red, lumpy, hot boob, sure sign the mastitis is on the way, and the solution for that is to get it drained, whether that be you doing it by heating up a washcloth and putting it on the breast and manipulating it by hand or getting a puppy on it. But you need to get on top of mastitis if it starts to occur. If you get to the point where it gets infected, then you, you may have to have surgery on that to go fix it, which means cutting it, getting all the muck out, putting stitches on it, and that dog will never have that 
that nipple functioning again, which is not a huge problem. But if you let this thing go and it doesn't get drained and it gets abscessed, you may get to the point where the dog's very, very sick, will not want to nurse any of the puppies, and now you've got a dog that's really in trouble. So get on top of that one. Number six is going to be eclampsia. Uh, eclamp, golly, I, I just know I'm spelling this wrong. Probably a Y in there. Almost certainly a Y in there. That's not even remotely right. James, your spelling is terrible. <laughs> eclamp, I don't know. Maybe like that. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, you're not here for a spelling lesson because I'm the wrong person for that. But eclampsia. Eclampsia is... When a dog has got puppies, it's, it's using up all the resources it has to make milk to make puppies. And one of the main ingredients of milk is, is obviously water and calcium. And if there's not enough calcium present, the dog gets calcium deficiency, and that shows up as eclampsia um, or milk fever. And that can, you can really get a dog in trouble over this. Again, if the temperature's above 101.5, sure sign that something's on, not right. So 101.5 or higher, enlist the vet. There are things that you can do to increase the amount of, of calcium a dog gets. We put cottage cheese on our food, it tends to make it more tasty for them and they can have a poor diet anyway. But cottage cheese can't hurt. I'm not sure how effective that is. I don't know how well calcium is absorbed orally ends up being used by the dog, but certainly it's a good start. Don't give too much um, cottage cheese because they can have diarrhea. Um, but there are other products. There are shots that you can give and there are other specific oral treatments for, for, for increasing calcium uptake. I don't know what the shot is. You have to get your vet to do that anyway. But be aware of the fact, if the dog's running a temperature, it may be eclampsia. And that's something that is going to require a vet visit, especially if the, temp if the temperature gets higher. Um, okay. Um, number seven is appetite. Appetite. So you can have a problem with a dog that loses its appetite. It might happen a few days, maybe a week before whelp. It may happen for a few days after whelp. And it could be worrisome, especially for a dog that's got a lot of puppies and is already looking skinny. Because obviously, Puppies have got to be made out of mum, and if mum doesn't have much to give, mum ain't going to be there. So what do you do about loss of appetite? I think that the answer is, is try varied and different approaches to feeding the dog. If the dog has been having just dry kibble, put it on a more medium wet or wet diet. We use a product called Bill Jack. Uh, we've had a lot of luck with Bill Jack. Bill Jack. Not available on the West Coast, I know. We buy it at our local Walmart. Comes in a frozen section in an orange bag. With, with kind of orangey red writing on it. Seems to work well for us, but it's not the only thing that can work. I mean, you can go to the effort of uh, boiled chicken and rice and, and, and feeding it that way. Sometimes feeding a dog by hand or get a dog that won't eat will eat out of your hand. So that's another thing, another trick that can help towards getting the appetite up. Um, I think we're about done with this. What else? I think that's it. I think that's it. All right. So. Uh, we will take that off the list. And uh, the next one's gonna be talking about things that we need to do for puppy's health. And uh, thanks, thanks for watching, watching the, the video. Uh, I really appreciate people who subscribe to me. It helps me, encourage me to do more of these videos. But do remember, disclaimer here, I am not a vet. I'm not a licensed medical professional. I'm purely a person who's been breeding dogs for the last couple of decades. Any information that you got from this video, use at your own risk. There's nothing implied here, and certainly this is, should not be used as a substitute for advice from your veterinarian or your medical professional. I hope you enjoyed the video. Come back for more of them. Bye. Mm -hmm.